With the introduction of Wi-Fi 7, Wi-Fi has never been more complicated. MIMO, QAM, Multi-RU Puncturing, AC, AX, 6, 6E, 7, Mesh, there's a lot to understand and I really wouldn't blame you for getting lost in the mess. But hopefully after watching this video, you'll have some idea of what that mess means and which Wi-Fi version is best for you. Let me clear up the naming schemes first. Wi-Fi, as defined by the IEEE, the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, is a standard number, 802.11. Much like German DIN standards all have numbers, or British BS standards, Wi-Fi is a standard code, 802.11. The different versions of Wi-Fi are one or two letters tacked onto the end of that number, so 802.11n or 802.11ac. Yes, IEEE went to the Windows school of naming things, because here is the order. B, A, G, N, A, C, A, X, and B, E. Great, right? The number is the generation, so for all intents and purposes, Wi-Fi 4, that's N, is the oldest version you'll need to know about. They threw a spanner in the works with Wi-Fi 6 and 6E because both are 802.11ax and there's also some confusion over AC having Wave 1 and Wave 2 despite no generation number difference. I know it's already a mess, but that's standards organizations for you. Long story short, both the suffix name like AC, AX or BE and the generation number like Wi-Fi 5, 6E or 7 describe the same thing, which is what version of Wi-Fi a device can use. The good news is that Wi-Fi is backwards compatible, generally anyway, so a Wi-Fi 5 device can still connect to Wi-Fi 7 router and vice versa. So the only real difference between the versions, at least to you, the end user, is speed and feature set, not outright compatibility. So what makes Wi-Fi 5 different from Wi-Fi 7? Well, let me walk you through each version, starting with 4. That is from 2009 and was the first to introduce both a standard 2.4 GHz and 5 GHz frequencies, although it was often split access point names, like there'd be router and router underscore 5 names to connect to. Those are called SSIDs, those different sort of network names, uh, although later versions generally refined that process. Version 4 had either 20 MHz or a double wide 40 MHz channel, although I should explain the difference between frequency and channel, since both are frequencies. The way that Wi Fi works is by frequency modulation, like FM radio. Let's say it, the, you're running exactly 2.4 GHz, that's 2400 MHz. Now just tra transmitting exactly 24 or 2.4 GHz isn't going to get you very far. So what you do is vary the frequency slightly, in this case by 10 MHz either side of that 2.4 or 2400 MHz. By changing the frequency ever so slightly, you can essentially encode data. The wider the channel, the more data you can encode at once, hence why N had the option to switch to using two 20 MHz bands in a combined 40 MHz mode for faster data transfer. There's also one extra encoding feature that you should know, at least in name. It's QAM or Quadrature Amplitude Modulation. Basically, this is how much data can be encoded per pulse. The higher the number, the more data. Gen 4 had a max of 64 QAM or QAM. Uh, the, the last feature also you should know about is called MIMO or multiple input, multiple output. Basically, this just means using more than one antenna at a time to double, triple or quadruple the speed. Gen 4 could use up to four sender and four receiver antennas, often written as four by four. All of that combines to a throughput of between 250 and 600 megabits per second, depending on the frequency, channel, qualm, and how many antennas were in use. Wi-Fi 5, that's AC, that was a bit of an interesting one, as that was 5 GHz exclusive, and often why there were two SSIDs for one network, because 2.4 GHz operation was still run with the older Gen 4, while 5 GHz operation was run with Gen 5. Confusing, right? 
Well, at least Wi Fi 5 made some big improvements to the 5 GHz network. It increased the QAM, uh, the amount of data sent at a time, to 256, up from just 64 on Wi Fi 4. It added much wider bands, now 20, 40, 80, and 160 MHz channels were available, up from just 40 with Wi Fi 4. And now you could even use up to 8 sending and receiving antennas if you wanted for a theoretical maximum of 6.9 gigabits per second. Although most real world devices ran at 1.9. 7 at most. Technically those 160 MHz bands and the wider MIMO supports came three years later with Wave 2 devices, that's 2016 and onwards. Standard organizations suck at naming stuff, because for most people you would struggle to know if your device was Wave 1 or Wave 2. One pretty big feature that was added in Wave 2 was DLMU MIMO, that is Downlink Multi-User MIMO, which is actually important as that whole using multiple antennas for faster transfers was actually only available to one device at a time. But with MU MIMO, well, that became available to multiple devices at a time, at least for downloads from the router anyway. One other feature you should know about here is something called beamforming. This is essentially where the router, well, the wireless access point side of the router anyway, picks which antennas the receiving device is connected to with the strongest signal and prioritizes sending data to that device with those antennas. It's simple, but can make a big difference in the speed and signal quality for sure. Wi-Fi 6 and 6E are both 802.11ax, although 6E is kind of the real star here. Wi-Fi 6 upped the QAM to 1024 and added a new feature called OFDMA, which is Orthogonal Frequency Division Multiple Access. Catchy, I know. Basically, that means that it can subdivide the channels for multiple users to help up the throughputs, especially with a busy network. I have to imagine that this is more useful in public spaces than at home. Uh, you know, maybe for, I guess it could be useful, especially if you have, say, someone who's gaming and streaming and a few other people who are just streaming videos. Being able to split up the channel so that they all get data at the same time means the gamer gets lower latency while the people watching the videos get an uninterrupted experience. Wi-Fi 6 also added a new security protocol, WPA3, which suffice to say is better than WPA2 in the, the previous versions, but it's still not exactly perfect. Wi-Fi 6E though added a whole new frequency, 6 GHz, so there are now 2.4, 5 and 6 gigahertz signals for a theoretical maximum of 9.6 gigabits per second. Although realistically, that's more like 2.4 gigabits per second max. Oh, and Wi-Fi 6 also added uplink support for the MU MIMO, so now traffic going both ways can use multiple antennas for faster transfers. Lastly, for the current Wi-Fi standards, Wi-Fi 7, that's 802.11be, and added a new 320 megahertz band, 4x larger QAM at 4096, and the important one is multi-link operation. That means that devices can connect with two or more frequencies or bands at the same time, either for speed or redundancy, which in theory means straight double the performance. That means that you can get up to 5.8 GHz real world speeds, which is incredible. An advancement to the OFDMA feature is multi-resource units and puncturing, which basically upgrades the ability to actually split up those wider channels when they aren't being fully utilized. Again, generally more helpful in busy access points, but it might still be useful for some people at home. One feature you might have also heard of, and perhaps a little confused why it hasn't been mentioned yet, is mesh. Mesh routers and access points have become pretty popular, and yet, they aren't part of the Wi-Fi standard. Mesh is a feature where a Wi-Fi router or access points can connect to other access points, often called satellites, to extend the Wi-Fi range. This is different to Wi-Fi range extenders in only really one but very key way. They don't use the Wi-Fi to extend the range. 
My Netgear Orbi routers, for example, use a proprietary wireless connection between the router and the satellites, which means the Wi-Fi frequencies are left clear for your Wi-Fi traffic. Mesh is, at least currently, a proprietary technology that each brand implements in their own way. It's kind of similar to enterprise Wi-Fi access points that are generally wired, but often offer fast roaming between access points. So even in a large area like a train station or an airport, you can connect to one network or SSID, but to various access points as you move throughout the building. So that's Wi-Fi explained. There's of course plenty more that, you know, detail we could go into here, but I think this is a decent overview to explain what each version means and the, the naming scheme, which frankly is pretty bad. Uh, and then also, you know, what each version can sort of offer you and therefore which version is for you. I learned an awful lot just making this video, so I hope it's been useful for you too. And if I've missed anything or if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments down below. If you want to see more videos like this one, hit the subscribe button and turn on the bell notification icon. Check out plenty of other videos on the end cards, and if you want to support the channel, you can check out the links in the description, including to my own hardware, the open source latency testing tool, and the open source response time tool at osrtt.com. Otherwise, that's pretty much it. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you all in the next video.